customer story. Jack and Barbara, professional wildlife photographers and b &H customers for 30 years.
Good morning. Good morning, everyone. What a delight to welcome everyone to Germantown Presbyterian Church this morning. People who are worshiping here in person, it's great to welcome you here. People who are worshiping online through our live stream, wonderful to have you join us as well. We are pulling out a few more chairs. It's great to have more and more. We put out 40 extra chairs today, by the way, so wonderful to have everybody here. We're pulling a few more chairs out. We want everybody to have a comfortable seat. Um, You could always sit up here and face out if you wanted to, I guess. This is for our deacon and elder installation in a little while, but what a great pleasure to welcome everybody this morning. Such a delight, and again, thank you for joining us. If you're worshiping with us online, then you'll see a place on our website where you can download today's bulletin. You can join along, and you can join every element of worship that we may be separated by some distance if you're at home being from being here, but certainly we can unite in this one act of worship. Please do sign the online friendship pad if you're worshiping with us online. You can do that and register your attendance with us uh, in, in from your own home. Also, if you're here, then you can see a QR code in your bulletin. You can go very quickly with your phone either now or after you leave and you get home. I did it last week just to test it to see how well it worked. And you can just put your uh, camera on that, sign in with your presence. There are also friendship pads over here on the uh, table by the entrance. You can use one of those as well if you'd like to register your attendance with us by signing one of the friendship pads here. You will see a rose on our baptismal font this morning, and that is in, uh, to give glory to God in celebration of the birth of Lila Marie Gooden, who is the daughter of uh, Jennifer and Michael Gooden, the little sister to Evelyn Gray and Rosalie, and the Goodens are in the back over there. So congratulations on her recent birth, and uh, we're so happy for you all. Grateful for her birth. The Goodens joined right before COVID hit. So not as many people have had a chance to get to know them, but we're so delighted for you all. We celebrate uh, that birth in your family and in your life, and we're grateful to God. So pray for the Goodens this afternoon. Good morning. Pray for little Lila Marie and uh, celebrate with them this happy occasion in their life. Friends, come back for evening worship this evening at 6. It'll be in here. You can come back for that. And my invitation this week stands uh, for this whole month. While space is at a premium, as it might be this morning, um, come to the evening worship service just once during the month of June. Just come and maybe relieve a little number pressure from the morning. Come and see that service. It's different instruments. It's a slightly different style, but it is wonderful worship, and you will you'll benefit, and the congregation will benefit from coming to that service. So I invite you to come to the evening worship service tonight at 6 or one Sunday this month at 6, and we hope, we hope, we'll be back in our sanctuary July the 4th. Uh, That's that's our hopeful timeline. You can poke your head in the sanctuary this morning. You can see the new carpet, and you can see what's been done to uh, renovate and fix the sanctuary. It looks wonderful, uh, and but please do um, be praying for those workers who are coming this week and next week to fix our pews and to get those back into the sanctuary as soon as possible. A wonderful thank you to everybody who worked so hard on VBS. It was a great week this week. Um, You'll see a little bit about that in just a few minutes, but what a wonderful week. It was so much fun. Um, Lots of volunteers behind the scenes. Lots of people worked so hard to make it a great week. And I know that our kids had fun, and I know that our adults had fun as well. So thank you so much to everybody who was here, who participated, and who helped to uh, volunteer to make VBS a great week for us. Friends, those are all of our announcements. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship God. Good morning. God invites us into a time of worship and praise. God calls us to join with others in the body of Christ to sing of God's holiness and love. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. It is good to give thanks to the Lord, to sing praises to your name, O Most High. 
It is good to declare your steadfast love in the morning and your faithfulness by night. For you, O Lord, have made glad by your work. At the works of your hands I sing for joy. Great are your works, O Lord. Your thoughts are very deep. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. They are planted in the house of the Lord. They flourish in the courts of our God. Let us worship God. Jesus came into the world to reconcile us to God and to one another. Knowing of our need for grace, let us confess our sin together. Let us pray. Lord, have mercy on us, for we are sinners. We cannot explain our sin, because it is irrational. We choose what is expedient rather than what is good. We choose to hurt those whom we love. We choose what is damaging against our own health and best interest. We lack the self-control not to sin. Have mercy on us. We humbly ask you, as we confess, without you, we are lost in our own poor choices. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God has mercy on us through Jesus Christ. Through Christ's obedience and death, we have forgiveness. Through his resurrection, we have new life before God. Amen. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you and also with you. As our children come forward for the children's sermon, please greet those around you with the sign of God's peace. peace. Thank you. Peace. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. You want to use the handheld or this? I'm going to use this because I need this area. Okay. 
okay. that's okay. Yeah, I think, or I, can use I think they'll pick that up. Good morning. As we all get settled up here, I'm so glad to see everyone this morning, all of these Vacation Bible School children, and we're really excited to celebrate Vacation Bible School today with song. And then following the worship service today, everybody, everyone in the congregation is invited down to the playground. We'll have an ice cream truck down there. And every item is between one and four dollars. So um, bring your cash, and we'll have a fun a fun time. I just wanted to make a quick announcement about summer Sunday school for children this this summer. We are kicking off next week our T-shirt Sundays. So. Um, we know people are traveling and out of town a lot in the summer, but when you're here on Sunday, we just encourage you to throw a t-shirt on your child and bring them to Sunday school. And we're going to have a fun time. Games, popsicles, it's just going to be a fun hour of um, learning about Jesus. So please bring them on Sundays and you can find more information and dates and everything in the window and um, on the e-blast, the weekly e-blast. But we do need Sunday school teachers. And let me show you how easy this is. We have teaching buckets prepared with all the materials, the lesson, and the supplies. So all you have to do is just email me that you can teach and we will email you the information on what the lesson is. And, and then you can know that your little bucket is prepared with everything. So we have made this as easy as possible. All we need are people that have hearts for kids and hearts for youth also. Um, but we need people who are willing to share their faith with our children. So if you will please be on the lookout for that this summer, we would really, really appreciate it. Thank you so much.
<laughs> I know, right? We come to this point in our service where we annually do this, and it's one of the most important things we do all year, and it's such an important time for our church where we ordain and install the new officers who will begin their term of service uh, as soon as they're installed. And it is such a grateful time for our church because we look back and we're grateful for those who have served in the last three years and all that they have done to sacrifice and to serve for the church. And then we anticipate with joy uh, new leadership and fresh leadership coming in to also lead uh, as servants and to lead our congregation. And so in just a minute, I will invite those to be ordained and installed to come forward and to stand in front of these chairs and face the congregation. Uh, but before they do that, we want to offer our heartfelt gratitude and our true thanks to these officers who are rolling off, who have served for the last three years, and uh, who have done a, a wonderful job in a most unique time in our church's life together. So please join me in being grateful for these who are rolling off as elders Lala Colmer, Lauren Utterback, David Jeter, Rush Smith, Kathleen Boyd, Beth Brock, Robert Shaw, Catherine Willingham, and these who are rolling off as deacons, Laura Brown, Susan Lipscomb, Bonnie Algie, Shirley Billups, Bill Carmichael, Richard Fast, and Audrey Holmes. And we do also remember with great fondness our friend Andrew Arthur, who was in this class of elders and who would have rotated off as well before his death last fall. We remember him fondly. Along with all of these elders, we are so grateful that they have given so much of their time, these deacons and elders both, so much of their time and their talents and their love for Christ exercised in leadership in this church. Please join me in thanking God for them and for praying a prayer of gratitude for them and uh, being grateful for all of their leadership. Now... And now, if you are being ordained and or installed into your position as a deacon or an elder, I invite you to come forward and to stand in front of one of these chairs and to face the congregation. As in one body, we have many parts, and each part has its own function. So all of us together with Christ are one body, and we all belong to each other. We have different gifts according to the grace God has given us. If your gift is to hear God's word, speak it out in faith. If your gift is service, live to serve others. If your gift is the heart of a teacher, Teach what is true. Let preachers preach with conviction and givers give freely. Let officers work diligently for the people. And let those who serve the poor serve gladly. Let us not lack for enthusiasm, but be ardent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in suffering, constant in prayer, supporting one another, and welcoming all. We are called into the church of Jesus Christ by baptism, marked as Christ's own by the Holy Spirit. This is our common calling, to be disciples of Jesus Christ and servants of our servant Lord. Within the community of the church, some are called to particular service as deacons, as ruling elders, as ministers of word and sacrament. The ministry of the church is shared by pastors and people so that all together may fulfill the mission to which we are called in Jesus Christ. Ordination is Christ's gift to the church, assuring that his ministry continues among us. Through ordination, God provides for acts of care and compassion for the world, for the ordering and governance of the church and for the preaching of the word and celebration of the sacraments. 
representing the one Catholic and Apostolic Church, Germantown Presbyterian Church now ordains Garrett Gines, Marianne Harris, Sue Kelly, Alice Kaiser, Greg Morgan, David Paris, and Annalee Eason to the Ministry of Deacons and ordains Bob Johnson, Sue Perrin, Terry Pickett, Debbie Reagan, and Chancellor Reynolds to the Ministry of Elders. And we install each one to active service in this congregation. Germantown Presbyterian also installs to active service those who have been previously ordained in the office of ruling elder. David Aslan, Alan Callicott, Ann Harbor, and Elizabeth Powell. And at a later date, we will install and ordain Graham Askew into the ministry of deacon. There we go. Deacons and elders, I invite you now to take these holy vows, which whether this is your first time or maybe this is something that you've done before, this is a lifelong calling to the service of Jesus Christ here in this place. So I have a few questions for you. Do you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him, Believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If so, say, I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and New Testament to be, by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal and God's word to you? If so, say, I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church, as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? If so, say, I do and I will. You're doing great. Will you fulfill your office in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of Scripture and be continually guided by our confessions? If so, say, I will. Will you be governed by our church's polity? And will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry and working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? If so, say, I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, to love your neighbors and work for the reconciliation of the world? If so, say, I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? If so, say, I do. And will you seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love. If so, say, I will. Now to our deacons. Will you be a faithful deacon, teaching charity, urging concern, directing the people's help to the friendless and those in need? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will. To elders, will you be a faithful elder, watching over the people, providing for their worship, their nurture, and their service? Will you share in government and discipline and serving in governing bodies of the church and in your ministry? Will you try to show the love and justice of Jesus Christ? If so, elders say, I will. Amen. And now for our congregation. Do we, the members of the church, accept Bob Johnson, Elizabeth Powell, Terry Pickett, David Aslan, Chancellor Reynolds, Sue Perrin, Debbie Reagan, Alan Callicott, and Ann Harbor as elders, and Sue Kelly, Marianne Harris, Annalee Eason, Alice Kaiser, Garrett Gwines, 
Craig Morgan, and David Paris as deacons, chosen by God through the voice of this congregation to lead us in the way of Jesus Christ? We do. Do we agree to encourage them to respect their decisions and to follow as they guide us, serving Jesus Christ, who alone is head of the church? We do. Thank you. And now following a practice that dates back to biblical times in ancient days to convey leadership and to convey the presence of the Holy Spirit upon leaders in the church, those who are called to serve would would kneel and they would receive the laying on of hands and they would receive the Holy Spirit. And so I invite all of you who are being ordained and installed to sit in the chair that is behind you. And I invite those of our officers, deacons and elders who are rolling off of service. If this is your last year and you are rolling off, I invite you to come forward and to lay hands on the shoulders of those who are in front of you if you stand behind them and if you are an immediate family member and you have someone up here who is being ordained and installed then you can also come forward and lay hands on them and their neighbor as well so please come forward those who will lay hands on these to be ordained and installed And you can lay hands on those who are laying hands on those by extension as well because it's a little tight. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you now because we give you our hearts and thanks for your grace toward us in Jesus Christ. We know that he lived and died and rose again, and through him we have life, and we have hope, and we have purpose. We thank you for your gift to us of your word, witnessing to us of your everlasting love and truth. And we give you thanks for the gift of service that you, by your Holy Spirit, have given to all of your people, so that we each may serve you as we serve others Lord, we praise you this day for all of these deacons and elders who have answered your call to service, for your love and the Holy Spirit toward them, for their service toward you, and for all the gifts and graces you have given them. As they take up this additional role of leading through service, O God, we pray that your Holy Spirit may give them a renewed sense of joy and an assurance in the knowledge of your grace. We pray that you may refresh them from on high, that you may equip and empower them for ongoing service. Lord, may they have a sensitivity to your leading and to the needs of all your people. Oh God, we pray that you would deepen in all of us the experience of your grace and make us more aware of the tasks that you have for all of us within your church, and especially, oh God, within your world beyond this church. May we all be aware of the gifts that you have given to each of us and that you may strengthen us in our life together. Empower the witness and service of all. Lord, as we ordain and install these officers, we recognize that if you had not first called them as your servants, no hands of ours could empower them, no prayers of ours could create them, no words of ours could ordain them. It is you, Holy Spirit, present at this time, in this place, in this moment that empowers them to be deacons and elders. With and by your Holy Spirit, O God, and with the presence of this congregation, we ordain them and install them to be set apart to the obligations and responsibilities of their offices. When they speak, Lord, may they say words of help and comfort. When they handle others, may they be kept warm by compassion and a heart held firm in the truth. When they lead your people in worship, guard them and guard their hearts against any vanity. May they be diligent in prayer and study and service. And we pray that they will see the world through the eyes of justice and mercy. 
In your name, we place our hands upon them and do ordain them to Christian ministry as deacons and elders. And may your faithful call to them be always evident in their lives. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand, deacons and elders. Deacons and elders only. Please stand. You are now ordained and installed into your respective office of deacon or elder. We praise God for you and we thank you in advance for all the ways in which you will love Christ through service of Germantown Presbyterian Church. Congratulations, and you are now installed into your office. I invite those who are standing behind them to greet them with the right hand of fellowship and welcome them into these offices. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated. always like to make a few connections between things we do in worship. And so if you use your imagination, and it won't be that hard, you can imagine one of these children who was up here singing just a few minutes ago will someday, pray to God, be a deacon or an elder in this church. And it all started because you volunteered to be a VBS teacher or a helper, or you brought snacks, you supported the effort in one way or another, and so one of those little kids, 25, 30, 40 years from now, will be installed as a deacon or an elder in this church, and I hope you praise God for that continuum of faith that we have in this incredible congregation, and we pray we'll have for many, many years to come. Let us pray. Spirit of God, you are the fire of love, and you are the light of truth. And so we long for you, O oh God, to inform our hearts and to inflame our minds. Come into each one of us and all of us together in what we read now and call us into a deeper discipleship as a result. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Our Old Testament lesson this morning comes from 1 Samuel 16. It is the story of the anointing of David. 1 Samuel 16, uh, verses 1 through 13. The Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul? I have rejected him from being king over Israel. Fill your horn with oil and set out. I will send you to Jesse the Bethlehemite, for I have provided for myself a king among his sons. Samuel said, how can I go? If Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I will name for you. Samuel did what the Lord commanded, and they came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came out meeting him, and they were trembling. They said, do you come peaceably? peaceably? He said, yes, peaceably. I've come to sacrifice to the Lord. Sanctify yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. And he sanctified Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they came, he looked on Eliab and thought, surely the Lord's anointed is before me now. And the Lord said to him, do not look on his, on his appearance or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For the Lord does not see as mortals see. They look on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, neither has the Lord chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shema pass by, and he said, Neither has the Lord chosen this one. And Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel. And Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any of these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all of your sons here? And he said, There remains the youngest, but he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and bring him here, for we will not sit down until he comes. 
He sent and brought him in, and now he was ruddy, had beautiful eyes, and was handsome. And the Lord said, Rise and anoint him, for this is the one. Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel sat and then went to Ramah. Our New Testament lesson comes from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. There is a similar theme in this one from the first. I think you'll pick up on it. 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 16. Paul writes, From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we no longer view Him in that way. So if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. All of this is from God who reconciled us to Himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. So that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making His appeal to the world through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake He made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. When I was growing up, there were uh, a number of us under one roof, seven of us human creatures, my dad and my two brothers, plus stepmom and two stepsisters, seven of us in all. And if that weren't enough, there was a pretty good stretch of years in there where we also had six pets, four dogs and two cats. The dogs were Princess and Sunshine, who were kind of a mother daughter combination, and they had a slim majority of lab in them. There were two other female dogs, Tar, who was kind of a miniature collie, and Ladybug, who was this shaggy beagle resembling mixture of many possibilities. The cats were Tiger, a real original name for a cat. Anybody else have a cat named Tiger out here by any chance? A few people. Tiger and Barrington were the cats. And if I had to make an educated guess, it's not even a guess, I'm quite sure of this, that for those years when I was growing up, a lot more of the household income was spent at the veterinarian than a pediatrician, I can assure you. I clearly remember those polar, sort of polar opposite reactions between my siblings and me and my parents when we discovered that Princess, who always stayed locked up in the palace with all of her female attendants, had nevertheless somehow escaped and caught the eye of a prince of dubious pedigree down the street. And soon we discovered that Princess would deliver a royal family. We found out the news and all the kids shouted, Puppy, so great! And our parents said, Puppies, oh great! Maybe you've had that similar reaction in your house. So my dad built, of course, a little special box out of boards and two-by-fours and planks and put it in a workroom and put those sawdust chips down and a cushion in the corner. And then we, over several weeks, got to, got to then watch the miracle of nature unfold under our own roof. I don't remember exactly how many puppies Princess had. It was at least six or seven. But I do remember the one, the yellow one who was the only one who was not some kind of combination of black and white. She was clearly also the runt of the litter. Much smaller than the other ones, her siblings would just completely push her out of the way, trying to fight for food. There's no way that that yellow one was going to win. We had to take special care of that little yellow ball of neglected fur, the runt of the litter. And that little yellow runt was not chosen, of course, by the neighbors. Of course, people came by to pick a puppy several weeks later, and they would pick the other ones because the little yellow one was the runt. It wasn't as healthy looking. It wasn't as good looking and stronger as the others. And so nobody chose the runt. So we kept her. And we kept loving on her and taking care of her. And she grew and grew and grew. And boy, did she grow. It's kind of reminded me of the little Clifford, the, riddle, the big red dog. Anybody know that story? He was the run of litter and then grew to be 25 feet tall. It reminded me of that because that little yellow runt just grew and grew and grew. And that was the one that we kept as sunshine. 
and she ended up growing bigger than her mother. Now, move from that sort of uh, canine family to the human family in our house, and maybe some of you were like me, that I was definitely the runt of the litter in the house growing up. I weighed, it seemed like, about 55 pounds for the first 10 years of my life, and just soaking wet, maybe 55 pounds. And it was very hard to compete for food in our house, and when you found it, you had to eat it quickly before somebody would steal it from you. And you think I'm kidding. I have older brothers who would steal anything off of my plate if it was fair game, which it seemed like it was for them. The runt is the punching bag and the servant of all the rest, always under constant threat of physical pain for any kind of disobedience. Any younger, youngest siblings out there who know exactly what I'm talking about, all right, thank Our support group for youngest siblings will be meeting this coming Wednesday night if you're still traumatized by some of the things that you went through. I do have, I have another very distinct memory of being the runt on the litter because the youngest child is always the servant of all of the rest. And I remember this specifically. It was always my job to get up and to change the channel so that none of the others would have to stand up and get up. And I'd realize this is back in the Pleistocene era when the Neanderthals would watch television in their caves and you actually had to stand up and turn a knob on the television in order to change it from one to the other three available channels that you might have. But it was clear that it changed the channel to channel five. There was no question about who was going to do it. It was me, <laughs> always the youngest in there. I don't know all the dynamics of the family in which David grew up in the Old Testament. I don't know all of those, but I think that we can see a lot from this story in 1 Samuel 16. You may remember from last week that this was the time period in Israelite history when the, the people demanded a king. They wanted to be like all the other nations around them. They were afraid for their future, and they wanted a king to protect them and to fight their battles. So Saul was chosen first. And there was a period of time when Saul did a, a very good job. He was actually a great commander, a great leader in battle. He had several different victories, but then he was also impatient. He was also risky. He was reckless. And so we read in the chapter just before this one where God says, I regret now that I made Saul king. He has turned his back from following me. He has not carried out my commandments. So God says to Samuel, we're going to start over. Let's do this again. Go up to Bethlehem where I will show you the next king who is one of Jesse's sons. Anoint him as king. Samuel, of course, is immediately afraid. If Saul finds out that there's going to be a rival to his throne, he will kill me. He'll put down anybody as treasonous. So God says to Samuel, go up and, and, go, and go under the guise of going to worship. Take a heifer with you and invite a man named Jesse and his family to join you for this act of worship. Now, what's interesting is when they, when they worshiped back then, they had to go through this ritually cleaning process, this washing process, so that they could be ritually clean before, before worshiping a holy and pure God. So Samuel, it says, sanctifies them. The elders of the town, he sanctifies Jesse, and he sanctifies all of those sons except one, to make them pure before God. And as all of these sons are coming before Samuel, he just sizes up every single one. The first one, the firstborn comes, and Samuel says, Oh, now I see why God brought me up here. Eliab, look at this strapping, strong, handsome young man. Surely this is the Lord's anointed. And God delivers this line to Samuel, and it is so important. God says, No. Do not make the mistake of judging who he is by what he looks like. Do not assume that this is the one I choose because of his outward appearance. And God says this, this great line, The Lord does not see like people do. People judge by outward appearances, but I look at the heart. And then the next son comes and Samuel says, well, maybe this is the one. Look at him. No, says God. And the next one, and the next one, and the next one, and the next one. All of these sons come before him. And God says, don't judge by what you see. Because I look at the heart. So yes, so much in our world, of course, the movement of history. So much. How much has changed in the 3,000 years since David lived? So much. But some things never change. Human instincts and the human way of seeing things haven't changed at all. 
We all make judgments, quick judgments about people based on their appearance, don't we? It happens instantaneously. I was fascinated several years ago by Malcolm Gladwell's book, Blink, because it's so informative. It demonstrates from an evolutionary view and a psychological view how we all size people up within just a few seconds of meeting them. And we do it from a variety of viewpoints that form our identity. Socioeconomically, politically, racially, culturally, even religiously, we make these quick judgments on whether we can trust people based on how they appear, what they look like physically, and what they wear. We are so quick to ignore that great gospel wisdom that we all know, that wisdom of judging someone not by the color of their skin, or we might add their hair, their clothes, their looks, judging them only by the content of their character. In other words, their behavior. Judge them by that. We're so wired not to do that. Hear me again say we are wired to make quick judgments on people based on whether we can be safe among them and trust them. That's how we are wired. But the gospel always makes us better than what we are hardwired to be. Gospel makes us better than that. Samuel asked Jesse, is this all you've got? Do you have any more sons? Jesse answers, saying in effect, yes, there is the runt of the litter, but he's out keeping the sheep. Well, of course he is. Of course David's out keeping the sheep. His dad and his stronger other, older brothers, they are not going to go take care of the sheep if there's somebody else that they can make go do it. Sometimes in our day and age, we have this sort of romanticized idea of what shepherding is like. We love the 23rd Psalm. We love the idea and the imagery of this wonderful, great shepherd coming alongside of us to lead us beside green pastures and still waters. But the truth about shepherding, the truth is that it was very rough and dirty work. It was one of the lowest paying jobs in that day and age. It was hard, gross, dealing all the time with wounds and blood and injuries and predators and, fe and feces and, and forces of death and birth. Why is David out taking care of the sheep? Because he is the least important of all of his brothers, even in his father's eyes. Samuel says to Jesse, go get him, because we will not even sit down until he shows up. And David does enter. He comes in, he still has all the elements of the field on him, which meant that he was not ritually pure. And God says, this is the one. Samuel, anoint him because he is the one I have chosen. Samuel anoints him, which was one of these great exercises we find in the Bible of pouring oil on someone to signify their presence within the Holy Spirit, that God's presence in their life is in great ritual. And from that day on, it says... The Spirit of God was mightily in David. God chose him, the runt of the litter, to be king. Now, do you see what's happening here? This, this great example, it happens over and over again. God does this so many times in Scripture. God does this so many times in our world that God overlooks the powerful and the headline makers and the pretty and the perfect one, and God chooses to work through the lowly and the weak and the humble. Humble people never make headlines in our self-congratulatory world where you congratulate yourself every time you even eat a meal now on social media. Now in our culture, the humble will never make headlines. And yet God chooses to work through them to change the world. I think you heard Paul pick up on this very similar theme in 2 Corinthians to talk about how God works in the world. He says this, Paul writes, from now on, we regard no one, no one from a human point of view. We all know what a human point of view is. We all know, all know what it's like to look at someone and to judge him or her so quickly based on what our eyes see from their appearance to what they wear. And I think in our culture, we're doing this now to a deeper and deeper degree. We all do it. You see people wear something like a red hat or a black t-shirt or a slogan or something. And you make an instant judgment about that person. 
you are willing to proclaim someone instantly as an ally or an enemy based on what they look like or what they are wearing. In the same vein, if people come in here sometimes, even in our church, and we make these quick judgments about who they are only based on what they look like or what they are wearing. Do you think that God looks at that person in the same way that you do? No. No. We all make judges, judgments based on appearances. And I've got my in, inherent biases, of course, built in to me as well. I learned a great lesson last weekend when a great friend from high school and college came back into town. And so a lot of us high school friends got together over at someone's house and another high school friend rolled up his sleeve to reveal his full arm, whole total arm sleeve tattoo. Now, it's not going to surprise anybody in here when I say that not a whole lot of the guys that I went to high school with have full arm, whole sleeve tattoos. But he did. And it represents all the loves of his life, he told us. I think about people who have full arm, sleeve tattoos, and I think about you know, folks that I watch on television, maybe professional athletes or bodybuilders. I think about people I may have a negative bias against, like gang members. But one of my good friends that I have known since kindergarten. How about that? Your heart won't me- let you make an instant judgment about someone that you know and that you care about. And my buddy is a great Christian. He's a great husband and a great father. He's a small business owner here in Germantown. And all of those tattoos he explained, they're a work in progress actually, they explain all the loves of his life from his uh, faith and his family, his daughters and his wife. Paul writes, if anybody is in Christ, there's a new creation. Everything old has passed away. Everything is new. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. Friends, that is it right there. This this ministry of reconciliation that God has given to each one of us. God has placed this responsibility of reconciliation into each one of our hearts as Christ's followers. If I am so quick to judge people by what they wear or what they look like, whatever my standards consider good or bad, then that ministry will be limited and it will probably never ever happen if I make such quick judgments about people. But we believe that God is at work. God is at work in us, and the gospel makes us better than we are wired to be, whether it's evolutionary or society or forces inside or outside of us. The gospel always makes us better than who we are. We believe that God is at work. God chooses people that we may not expect to carry out God's work in the world. It's always amazing to me, for example, that Rosa Parks could be so small at 5'2", and yet be such a spiritual giant. God used a man who stuttered and dressed like a slob and drank too much in the pub to write some of the most spiritually Christian books ever. C.S. Lewis. God used a lowly Catholic priest in the poorest and most violent parish of Los Angeles to start Homeboy Industries, which now leads the nation in helping over 10,000 people a year get out of gangs and into a rewarding life. Look at any of the agencies that we partner with in our mission here at GPC, you'll see the most ordinary people doing the most spiritually extraordinary things ever. And so we have to learn and relearn and learn again to always look at the heart and what comes out of the heart and not somebody's outward appearance. And then to finish this very quickly, I just want to look especially at those that we have just ordained and installed into servant leadership here at GPC. Please know that God is going to use you for this reconciling work. God is going to use you here at GPC to help build up the kingdom of God. God will teach you. God will guide you. I'm quite sure that at some point God will humble you. God will raise you up and inspire you to be more faithful and to be better than you ever thought you could be. You may not think of yourself as a great Christian, 
Some people come to me privately after they have been named by the nominating committee and they just can't believe it. Why me? Someone says, I don't know the Bible enough. Some of you question why you would be chosen as a deacon or an elder. You doubted your faith maybe. You don't think that you're good enough. You might even think others are so much spiritually uh, mature than you are, the runt of the spiritual litter you call yourself. God doesn't see you that way. And neither do we as a church. God has chosen you to be an ambassador for Christ right here in this congregation and out in the world. God has chosen you to lead this church. God is at work in you and in all of us to help build up the kingdom. From now on, because of God's reconciling grace, we view no one from a human point of view. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. As God has nourished us through his words read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand as you are able as we recommit ourselves to Jesus Christ through saying together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. What a blessed morning of worship we have already experienced. And now we come to that place in our worship service where we are blessed yet again to pray for one another, to pray for our world, to pray for our church. And so let us now turn our hearts and our minds to Almighty God through prayer. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love. Send us power. Send us grace. O God, by water and the spirit, you have claimed us as your own and anointed us for your service. Build up the body of Christ in your love and equip the church for the work of ministry. Make us one body in Christ, where each one's gifts are honored and used for the good of all. We pray for those who serve the church, especially these new church leaders. May they and all of those who minister in the name of Christ be wholly led by your truth. Holy God, we pray for the church and the community of disciples. Grant that we who claim the name of Christ may shine as light into our dark world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal God, we pray for our world. We pray for the governments and the leaders. We pray that all of those who rule will honor justice and compassion and serve the common good that the people may flourish. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the sick, the hungry, the poor, the homeless, the oppressed, the silenced, the addicted. We pray for those who grieve, those who feel alone and isolated, those who miss their loved ones. We pray for our own families and our friends and those that are important to this community of faith, and we name them before you now, holy God. Lord God, those that we have named in our silence and others that you know 
We ask that your blessings be with each one, that you bless them with all that they need for this day. To you, O God, we pray through Christ, with Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And now we boldly come before you, praying the very prayer you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. In thee is not temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, all that we have and all that we are are gifts to us from Almighty God. So let us now, with great joy and generosity, return to God the gifts that we have received. If you're worshiping with us in person, you'll find the offering trays as you leave here by the doors. And if you're worshiping with us online, you can go to the GPC website in the giving tab, and there you can find so many ways to contribute to the work of the church called into being by Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Let us give with great joy and generosity. Thank you.
Would you pray with me? God, when we search the depths of our hearts, we see that there is definitely a runt identity in all of us, a lack of worthiness, and yet you see the whole picture, and you still, in the mystery of your love, have chosen us to be your people, to come into your presence and to be transformed by your goodness. So we commit to you out of deep and abiding gratitude these tithes and offerings. And we ask, Lord, that you would take and that you would multiply them for your glory, not for ours. So that all who come in contact with us, this family of faith, would walk away saying, I have seen the face of God. We thank you for all that you have provided and all that you have sustained in us. And we commit ourselves to you this day. This we pray in your holy name. Amen. Now, Christian friends, remember the words of Scripture that say, keep alert, stand firm, be courageous and strong, and let everything you do be done in love. And so go out into this world to love and serve the Lord. Go out to love and serve your neighbor as yourself. As you go, may the grace of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit descend upon you and dwell in your heart and in your mind forever. Amen.